So one of the first things I'm going to be doing in this project is diving into some of the past research that has been conducted by Dr. Freeman and published, uh, including this article here, which is the importance of cognitive diversity for sustaining the commons. Just from the title alone, that has my interest, I think, very applicable to what it is that I'm interested in getting at. I'll be referring to this uh, working diagram that I've put together. And within this model here, in this circle, represents aspects that must be present in order to, to predictively model a intelligence selection pathway. One of the things that I'm examining specifically is the idea of a limited birthing infrastructure. And I get more into that, and that perhaps may be one of the avenues that I uh, focus on specifically for the purposes of publishing something. So underneath that, I've included a space for um, what I list as superordinate species risks. And we might also think of that as uh, threats. So when it comes to acquiring resources that the group is going to need to survive, so let's say food, especially if you're in situations where you have food scarcity, you need certain ways of thinking to help survive a changing condition set, environmental condition sets. And that's what this article gets into. The importance of cognitive diversity for sustaining the commons. So a few uh, points of interest here that the article mentions here right in the beginning. A system with higher functional diversity and redundancy of functions allows ecosystems to withstand disturbances and maintain a consistent level of productivity. Uh, that redundancy of functions is an interesting point. Uh, we see this across different species. We see it in humans, for instance. Uh, we are not narrowed down to depending on a singular food source, for instance. We are able to burn fat, we're able to burn carbohydrates primarily, and we can also even, to a certain extent, burn amino acids directly, or we can convert amino acids to uh, sugar-like compounds. So we have a redundancy built in that we have multiple ways of solving the same question, or the same survival need of getting enough calories to sustain the organism. So it's pretty rare that you have bottlenecks to very specific things. Well, then again, maybe it isn't as rare as you think. And because 99% of all species are not even here. So we represent everybody alive, every organism alive now represents something that's working well enough to exist in these current condition states. But the issue is if you become too narrow, if you become too specialized in something, you can thrive within that specific set. But if conditions were to change, you've become so dependent upon that specific setup that you no longer are fit and you will go extinct or you'll have to radically adapt. And that radical adaptation is going to depend upon the presence of variety within your population set. So as you reduce variety, you increase your vulnerability to changing future conditions. One of the things humans have done is through the evolution of intelligence, we've been able to ex essentially inhabit the metasphere of the earth itself. We, we can tailor an environment using technology to make ourselves able to survive there. We can simulate subtropical conditions in the Arctic if we need to. And so we are our own mobile zoos in a way, but that is opened up to us because of what we're able to do with uh, tools, technology, and which depends upon our intelligence and our awareness of what's coming down the pike. So akin to functional traits in ecology, Cognitive functional traits, these are traits that we uh, think with, right? These are thinking styles in a sense, such as general, and that's abbreviated there with just a lowercase g, and social intelligence, specifically theory of mind. So we're seeing a distinction here between g and 
theory of mind, are domain general mental abilities that allow individuals to process information and adapt in social ecological settings. So G reflects the variance common to mental tests. So an example, IQ tests and measures the ability of individuals to engage in complex reasoning and abstract thought. So tying this in with, let's say, Piaget and thought, uh, as our, we develop our cognitive abilities and uh, boot up to a formal operational stage around 12 or so where we can do hypothetical reasoning and abstract thought, this is facilitated by our ability to engage in G-like processing. Now, theory of mind is defined here as the ability to model and reason about the intention of others. So that's another uh, cognitive thing that we see develop uh, through early, you know, through the boot up phase of the human being. We come to interact with our social environment and we learn about the intention of others or intentions of others, I should say, in the plural. Without getting too far uh, away from the paper, I want to keep this all relevant. But this idea of considering the intentions of others, the way that I have considered this up to now is that considering the intentions of others is often um, inferential. It is not that you have somebody tell you explicitly, this is what I'm thinking. It is a lot of inferential processing. We infer what someone else is thinking or doing. So that's a sort of uh, fluid type processing. And I, to me, that makes sense as far as being able to be prepared to read the cues of a nonverbal infant, for, for instance. So I do think women generally have an advantage in that cognitive domain. But considering what someone else may be doing, their position, or what they may um, do next. There's an interesting study about this uh, with chess players. Because if you think about what chess is, um, it's a good chess player is able to anticipate what their opponent is doing or what their opponent is considering doing. And a really good chess player can, can calculate this out to many, many moves in advance. And one thing I conjectured about this is that if you're wiring up empathy, you're wiring up the ability to contemplate positional states of somebody else you're able to consider your position and you're able to say well what might they be doing your awareness of how you feel means that someone else might feel that way too and so if you're up to something then maybe they're up to something as well so all of that is opened up to us once we have complex awareness and so that would make a prediction that empathetic processing will cohabit as it were the ability to engage in something very cognitively complex like chess i guess a way of trying to distinguish what i'm trying to get at here is i think that there might be a level of nuance here that differentiates between sort of dry inferential processing and intuitive inf in emotional processing so someone might be able to make a very dry prediction about what their chess opponent is going to do, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to translate to a nuanced social awareness or fluid fluidity. But I think they are bordering the same cognitive structures. They're both part of the puzzle of what complex consciousness is, but they're not exactly one and the same. So now let's go on here with social groups govern a common pool resource system. A common pool resource system is a system in which resources, resources are non-excludable. So all individuals have access. So things that are in the public domain, as it were. And the harvest decisions of each individual affect the availability of resources, resources for the entire group. So this is, we can see our instinct as parents in a way to teach our children to share even though they don't want to at times 
Well, there are survival reasons, adapted survival reasons, that we have to learn how to share, and we can't be too intolerable for everybody else that we're socially excluded in our distant past, or even not so distant past, that could have spelled death for the individual. So resources for the entire group, i.e. the resource is rivalrous. So in this, we're somewhat discussing a zero-sum game or social trap theory as well. So in such systems, governance entails developing rules and norms that allow individuals to harvest the resources now and at the same time create create incentives for sharing and preserving the resources for future generations. Preserving the resources for future generations. So again, tying this with additional psychological considerations, we learn about Erickson's models. And one of the stages in Erickson's model of lifespan is this idea of generativity. So stagnation versus generativity becomes a distinct phase in the lifespan where it becomes important for the individual or the human to pass on or be considerate and concerned about the future generations. And that we can consider in terms of evolutionary selection as a favorable phase of a life to have uh, selected for because it preserves the health and well-being of the future. And we see sort of this heave-ho where at the time a person's entering that phase where they're concerned about the well-being of the, f the future of the good of the whole society, um, then you have the 20-somethings emerging who are just chomping at the bit to bring about revolution right, and change, and, and, and they're open to new ideas and impressionable, and not, this is also when the Dunning-Kruger effect peaks. So you have radical uh, waiting ide idealists to emerge, and, and you have sort of your older, more experienced members of the tribe who are trying to preserve. And so ideally you what you have is sort of a dialogue, an interactive dialogue between the forces of change and the forces of preservation. And if the system is to adapt and survive, then it will integrate um, the structure that needs to remain and the adaptive changes that need to uh, prepare it for the current environmental context in which it now lives. So what organisms do historically in, in selection to survive is what our broader social systems mirror or need to mirror in order to predict their survival because, again, with the idea of how fractal patterning tends to play out in across species, even when we look at strategies of plants and animals, if you look at things like RK selection theory, we can overlay a certain set of considerations that whether we're looking at plants or whether we're looking at animals, there's a certain set of predictive things that tend to happen. And so we arrive at these constructs or this awareness that you have to integrate both flexibility and structure within the organismal framework to predict its survival. And again, I'm sort of fast-forwarding on some of what I get to in the thesis, but what I'm proposing is that this awareness or this necessity for balanced levels of um, flexibility and structure end up merging into the way that we communicate certain archetypal concepts, and this appears in storytelling. It appears in religious um, considerations as well. So in other words, there's a tug of war going on. We can't become too selfish or we'll destabilize our own survival odds. And we can't also just give away everything because then we might die as well. So both instinct sets are present in the brain. The instinct to preserve the individual, but once we become aware of our standing and our reputation and social standing, that informs other decisions that we make. And so reputation, the evolution of awareness of our reputation is also a constituent into how these systems end up balancing out. So in order to assess the relationship between a group's ability to sustain common pool resources and cognitive abilities, we conduct behavioral experiments in a spatially explicit common pool resource system. So this here, spatially explicit 
common pool resource system. This is something that I would like a little bit more clarification on. Maybe I will talk to Dr. Freeman tomorrow about that to test the functional intelligence's proposition. So one of the things I've been doing as I've been reading this article is going through and modeling or extracting out some of these ideas so I can have a visual representation of them. I find that very helpful. So let's see if I can maybe break this down. So we have G, which is the aspect of cognition or a cognitive style of thinking that informs contemplation of resource dynamics. And we might think of this as sort of... um, engineering type thinking in a way and we have theory of mind which informs contemplation of intention of others so we're the article is distinguishing those as discrete neurological uh, strategies and attached to them are the things that they facilitate so g facilitates the contemplation of resource dynamics theory of mind intention of others and we we can say that maybe these constitute the collective cognitive abilities within a group So if you think of there's a problem that needs to be solved, and to solve this problem requires a certain type of cognitive processing. So within the group, you need a sufficient amount of G processing, and you need a sufficient amount of theory of mind processing. So one thing that this makes me consider is the way that we would model this or predict this with individuals and the group as a whole. So one thing we see in nature recurring is this idea of fractal patterning patterning so on one sense we could look at an individual brain and say how much of this individual brain how much of the let's say metabolic resources within this singular brain are devoted to theory of mind cognition and how much is devoted to g cognition and what we might consider is that within a single mind So here on this graphic here, we have cognitive allocation. What this is, is sort of a Venn, an overlapping Venn diagram. And each of these circles represents a cognitive set, a cognition set. So we have resource, we might think of this as processing. So we have resource dynamic processing, and we have intention of other processing. And while these represent distinct processing The average mind is capable of engaging in both of these to a certain extent. And this we might consider to be the average. But on our poles here, we will have, and these aren't necessarily to scale, it's just to illustrate this concept, you will have what what we might consider specialists. So someone who specializes in G processing and someone who specializes in theory of mind. And so on one extreme, we might see something that we would refer to as autism. And the other, we would have what sometimes people refer to as an empath, or someone who's so connected to the emotions and feelings of others that it can almost be problematic in their lives. But this is group cognitive capital, right? This is a what the group as a whole brings as far as processing power to issues. And you need a functional diversity to solve environmental challenges. And this is how we see life distribute with uh, trait distributions generally. We can normalize distribution curves and see a range. So the the average is going to live in this region here. And as we get Uh, further and further out on standard deviations, we see more and more rare cases. But these poles often fulfill a very useful function, even if it's in limited, uh, let's say, phenotypical expressions. And oftentimes, when we see um, evolutionary shifts, these are the areas where we're getting our fodder, as it were, for new uh, selection pathways. So a species might, for example, exhibit, you know, something that's quite different from the norm within one of these regions on a particular trait, and then the environmental conditions change, and suddenly that becomes advantageous. And so that then be, becomes selected for, and then the distribution curve over the course of generations will essentially recalibrate where that previous outlier becomes the average. 
So one of the things that uh, I'm considering in this model here is that there are limitations to how far you can draw uh, intelligence selection pathways if you decouple it from empathy processing. And another way of saying this, or what I'm essentially positing here, is that empathy cognition, to wire up a brain capable of engaging in complex empathy, is to wire up a brain capable of processing complex awareness or consciousness. So as I continue to read through this, I will make some more notes. But this represents a preliminary update for this process. And it's Thursday, September 26th, 11.09 p.m. traditionally see this, but what I have here is a, a G to theory of mind ratio. So we might think of this as a distribution curve of what a ratio is between how much of your brain is devoted to G cognition and how much it is devoted to theory of mind cognition. And the majority of the population is going to be within here. And this doesn't necessarily tell us that it's a 50-50 mix. This just represents what the the baseline, the average baseline is in, in that ratio. But one idea here is that if we get further on this pole, so as...